Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Today is April 7, 2020. My name is Leon Weinstein, podcasting from Los Angeles, California. I want to share with you some thoughts about life under coronavirus, the worldwide panic and fear, and tell you from my experience that there is nothing more permanent than the temporary surrender of freedom. Allow me to introduce myself. I am an emigre from the Soviet Union, a country that doesn't exist anymore. In 1972, the United States agreed to send 1 million tons of wheat to the Soviet Union. The perennial shortages of food in the USSR had become critical at that time, even worse than the usual failures under any central planning system. The United States agreed to help the USSR on conditions that the Soviets allow the immigration of 50,000 people who had been refused permission to leave the country. I was among this group of 50,000 who left and, and I have been happy ever since. In order to find out how much you paid for me, you can divide 1 million tons of wheat by 50,000 people and see, probably, that you purchased me from the Soviets for 20 tons of wheat. Wholesale prices, of course. Roughly, you paid $4,000 uh, in, in, in today's dollars, today's money. You might think that you made a mistake. However, uh, there is no more USSR. And even if you think that you overpaid, tough luck. You will not be able to get a refund. Putin is not Costco. Also, I must tell you that I really, really wouldn't want to go back to the USSR, to the old Soviet style, old Soviet life. As a matter of fact, this is exactly what I want to talk with you about. I am watching the United States, the country I love, the country that cherished Voltaire's words, that I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And Franklin's, Benjamin Franklin's state that those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. And famous Ronald Reagan's statement that freedom is never more than one generation from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the blood stream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on to them to do the same. I'm very much afraid that my generation didn't do its job. Uh, as a matter of fact, I do not like John Kennedy's slogan, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. It validly depends on what country you live in, why should anyone do anything whatsoever for the Soviet regime that sent people to gulags, treats them, treated them as dirt and enslaved them into, into the bargains? Bernie Sanders will probably argue that the Soviet gave us free education. But Believe me, it was the purpose of indoctrinating the people. Free medicine, yeah, but only for political elite they got prompt, high-quality medical care. Practically free housing, but, but often people had to wait years and years and years to get it. The Soviets gave the people a right. Actually, they called it obligation to work. But they arrested you if you would find out, if they would find out that, that you are not working. The Soviets took guns from our hands and had no fear entering our apartment to arrest us at any time for any reason whatsoever. The Soviets took our passports away. They, they granted a right to travel abroad if you have left a close relative behind as a hostage you know, for your return, or if you were one of the political elite. They paid the people salaries that were barely, barely enough to buy food and very poor quality clothes. There was a saying among the Soviets at my time, they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. Okay, 
It's so terrible, you would probably say, but what it has to do with us, Americans? It has everything to do with you. We are suffering now from the coronavirus pandemic, but also from political oppression by the state. Why do I call it oppression? Because in the name of public health, many small businesses are closed, many large businesses are not functioning. These businesses are called non-essential, but they are essential to their owners and, and to their employees, who were thrown out of work. The United States will create $2 trillion emergency help and will print $4 trillion in addition to that in money created out of the thin air. The impact of this cannot be predicated, but some things will happen for sure. People staying at home and getting paid. Great. But they're not producing goods. They're not providing services either. I know personally two computer geeks who were supposed to work remotely, but their equipment stopped working and they cannot find a single place to repair it. Because of fear, we will be afraid to go out to exercise because of the threat that we will be punished. If, if even we go out to play tennis on, on a tennis court, we are in the process of agreeing to allow our government to track all our movements in order to find whom we met during the last two weeks. Or maybe they are already tracking us without our knowledge, I don't know. And then those people whom we met are tracked to see whom they met. It is all to identify you know, who might be infected. It's for a good cause, they say, but, and, and, and we believe them because we are scared. That tells me that the government and our phone companies and God knows who else can track all our movements and know precisely whom we meet, whom we eat with, what we ate, what clubs and organizations we associated with and what we were talking and with whom. Is that scares you? It, it scares me a lot. If the Soviet secret police, the KGB, had such power, the Soviet Union would still exist. And I would be in prison for decades, probably along with many of my friends, except those who were on the KGB payroll. In America, we do have food on the shelves of stores, we still have supplies and spare parts, thanks God. But it is because someone is making them for us. Who? Probably, I would say, Chinese. We are not making them. We made less and less and less, you know, what we used during the last 20 years. But we need to pay for those supplies whatever they're called, essential, non-essential, we are borrowing and printing money to pay for goods and services. And we are not producing or producing less and less of anything to sell to others. One day, our suppliers will tell us to pay or else. And, and what does or else mean? It means that there will be shortages of food or medicine. We saw already fist fights for toilet paper. What do you think will happen after people have been standing in lines for hours to get food and suddenly they were told that it's not enough food for the whole line? This is what life was in, in, in the Soviet Union, in the USSR. If by the months of May our country is not working and not producing, we will give away more and more and more of our freedoms. Notice that Google is already policing us. Facebook, YouTube, censoring what can be published. They call it uh, being politically correct to hate speech, to censor opinions they don't like we may not be allowed to demonstrate against the government or their policies. 
we may not be allowed to go door to door to gather support for our initiatives. Fear will be aroused in the people if the government is allowed to do with our freedoms whatever they want. To order us to do whatever they say is good for the tribe, good for the people. One California city is even using night vision equipped drones, made of course in China, to search for violators of the state's government orders. Maybe some of you will recall Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, where such things happened. A city in Washington encourages citizens to snitch on those who violate the stay home order. Is this not like George Orwell's 1984. Travel has been curtailed. Americans are stuck abroad not knowing when they can return home. There is a debate whether or not to allow cruise ships to come ashore, ships filled with our neighbors who want to return home to their families. Americans are giving up basic rights eagerly, and it's already, they think temporarily, altered how our society functions. I'm absolutely sure, I'm convinced that there is nothing more permanent than the temporary surrender of freedom. I, I wish I want to be wrong. And do not forget the tens of thousands of our fellow Americans who will suffer mental illnesses from the fear being created. The consequences of fear and panic will make people stressed and sick and will cost us lives. We already have enough suicides. I, I will not be surprised if the numbers will be doubled. I'm not bl blaming Trump. I understand his situation and, and wouldn't want to be in his shoes. If he had not reacted the way he did, the fearful mobs would kick him out of the White House. Maybe, maybe some were counting on that. I am sure that many of his opponents are happy with the situation. They were eager to have American life ruined and the great American recovery stopped. Like Millions of others, I personally heard them saying that. They wanted something bad happening to us, if only this bad will help to kick Trump out of the White House. But I want the President to know that there are millions of us who think that if America does not go back to work by May 1st, there will be dire consequences that might be much graver than anything that is happening with the pandemic. We will see food riots, we will see shortages of everything including essential things, we will see more stimulus packages and more and more intrusion in, of the government to our lives, we will see millions of small businesses failing, unemployment soaring and fear about the future in people's hearts. The people will be told by Bernie or Elizabeth or Alexandra or by uncle, old Uncle Joe that only Big Brother, big friendly government will help, will take care of you. And some might agree. I fear a beginning of civil war if that would happen. This is what happened in, in the Soviet Russia when the country experienced shortages of food, shortages of medicine, energy, and the people had no protection from criminal gangs. One gang took over the Communist Party gang. Fellow Americans, you will end up with the government paid, they see free for you, medicine, government paid education and housing. You will see how government takes your spare rooms, apartments, houses and populate, populates them with poor, unemployed and homeless people and, and they will do it in the name of humanity. 
everything will be free, but we know that someone has to work hard, in, so it will be free. And on top of those wonderful things that you will be getting for free, you also will get a couple of hundred bucks per mo a month for food and bed clothing. And you will live knowing that you're a slave, like we did. But you will not dare to say that, because the big government doesn't like ungrateful people. There are re-educational camps to help you understand how lucky you are. This is not a picture exclusively of the communist Russia. It can be seen today in, in socialist Cuba, in North Korea and Venezuela and many other places. For humanitarian reasons, the state will confiscate the energy sector and other important sectors of the US economy. Do you think that cannot be happening in the United States of America? Think again. New York governor Cuomo is sending troops to private hospitals to take from them ventilators and personal protective equipment. He is sending soldiers to take by force something from private citizens, private business. And what will happen if the owner will say no and get out of my property? He will be taken into custody, and if he resists hard enough, he or she will be killed. The government then will exercise full control over the financial industry, and if you decide to run against them in even local elections, they will soon find out what you were saying to your first girlfriend at high school prom and turn it against you. I hope we will not come to that. I hope Americans are resistant to that ideology. But life shows us that people will be ready to do many things out of fear. If someone instills fear in the people, then it is easy to manipulate them. Very easy. Now, several words about reality. Now, several words about reality. We were looking at Italy uh, all the time and, and getting really very scary numbers. One day 700 people died, another day 1,000 people died. But, but let's go one step deeper than that. I googled the, the death rate in Italy during the last several, last several years, and here's what I found. In 2017, out of 1,000 people died 10.7 from different causes. In 2018, out of 1,000 10.5. In 2019, 10.7 back like in 2017. In 2020, based on the first quarter projections, we're told that the death rate is going to be, no, we're sure, you and I, that it was much, much, much more than in, in the previous years, right? Wrong. The projected death for 2020 is 10.6 per 1,000 people, meaning less than in 2017 and 2019, and only slightly more in 2018. But how that can be? We were told that huge amount of people dying, hospitals are filled to the rim, and so on. Maybe here are the explanations. Maybe. More than 99% of Italy's coronavirus fatalities were people who suffered from previous medical conditions, according to a study by the country's National Health Agency. Almost half of the fatalities were suffered by people with at least three prior illnesses, more than 75 had high blood pressure, 
about 35 had diabetes and a third suffered from, from heart disease and the average age of those who died from the virus in Italy uh, are you ready for that? was 79.5 years of age they were old and sick people as of mid-March, only 17 people under 50 had died in Italy from this disease. All of Italy's victims under 40 were males with serious existing medical conditions. A separate study shows that Italy could be overestimating the real number of cases or real percentage of deaths by testing only patients presenting symptoms. In other words, probably the death rate in Italy is way smaller than what they say. It may be even as Center for Epidemic Studies in Israel suggested between 0.3 to 0.45 percent. Remember the report from the Imperial College in London that said that 500,000 will die in England and 2.2 million people will die in the US if we do not do something drastic. This report was the trigger for both President Trump and British Prime Minister Johnson to start drastic measures to shut down our countries. But the Imperial College has now published an article saying that they had a flow in their calculations and their new model shows that 0.66% of infected people will die. Hmm. Now, that's more than from the regular flu, like twice as much, but not as many as will die in traffic accidents or drug overdose if if it is way less than, than people will die from committing even suicides or from smoking. I hope very much that America has learned several lessons during this outbreak. One is that we need to make everything essential for our lives here. You just never know when the outsourced product can disappear. We will need to figure out how to make them inexpensive and keep, uh, and keep them good quality, high quality. This is difficult without vigorous competition, but, but it's doable. Can you imagine how results of those investments will raise our standard of living? Two, we must invest in our infrastructure. However, we cannot borrow money from the Chinese again and again and again. We need to figure out how to raise private money to rebuild our bridges and our roads. Maybe by giving investors the right to operate those roads by themselves on a commercial basis for, for a certain period of time. As a matter of fact, private roads are not a bad idea. They are a good idea. Privately owned food supply stores, no objection from anyone, right? Okay, this is my, my own personal opinion. Three, we will need to figure out, in case someone brings new virus or any other disease into our country, how to become a nation that does not stop functioning if biological welfare is unleashed on us. I'm, I'm not trying to, to, to hint to anything. Uh, it is one of our priorities, fellow Americans. Some aggressor will unleash biological warfare on us, especially after they saw what, what this pandemic did to our country. And four, we need to change two systems, at least immigration laws and school education. We should be able to stop anyone who comes here without our approval, and we need to bring here bright and educated people in order to build our new economy. And we need to produce smart and knowledgeable people in America itself. 
that our public education showed us decade after decade that they are incapable, unable to do. Uh, that can be done by vouchers and creation of competition between schools, in my opinion. Sorry, teachers union, but kids are more important for us than your seniority and your job stability. It is a war and you are standing in the way of our children's ability to fulfill their dreams. I want to ask anyone who agrees with what I said, please go to petition itself on the White House website. We will give you the address and the link and please sign the petition. I want this plea to reach the White House in time. They need to know that we want to return America to its greatness. Thank you for listening. Please go and sign the petition now, again. My name is Leon Weinstein, and I am asking for your approval of this message.